you're putting some sort of blame on me that no, it, I said but then that but then what just set off a spectacular fire two workers are dead and here's abc's charles murphy right to left views that gives you the impression of three-dimensionality and because the transition hi The Media Laboratory at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is a center for advanced study and research in new information technologies. More specifically, the Media Laboratory is a place where the invention of new means of communication is tied to their innovative use. Until now, the various means of communication developed from inventions in separate disciplines and, as a result, found different academic homes as they matured. In the absence of common imperatives, the invention of new media and its creative uses have, for the past 50 years, occurred separately and without mutual support. The Media Laboratory aspires to eliminate this isolation by bringing together the most advanced thinking with the most advanced research in imaging technology, interactive systems, theories of computation, and the human cognitive system. Twelve previously separate groups or programs have been assembled from different schools and departments within MIT to form a new and unique interdisciplinary laboratory. These groups or programs are electronic publishing, learning research, advanced television, music research, spatial imaging, graphics, human-machine interface, speech research, film and video, computer animation, entertainment research, and movies of the future. While each group emphasizes differently the development of content versus the medium or channel itself, their common purpose is to give new scope to media technologies. The Media Laboratory is housed in the new Wiesner Building, named in honor of Jerome Wiesner. Designed by I.M. Pei and partners, the building was officially dedicated October 2nd, 1985. It's equipped with the world's most sophisticated computing equipment, including a supercomputer, four mainframes, 60 AI workstations, and over 300 personal computers. In addition, the facility includes a large collection of special peripherals and signal processors for the production and recognition of all forms of sound and picture. Research Group's School of the Future project takes place in a Boston elementary school. Director Seymour Pappert. The Hennigan School is a public inner city elementary school. It was selected in part because of the composition of its student body. 40% black, 40% Hispanic, 18% Caucasian, 2% Asians. From the side of academic performance, it has a magnet school program and is able to draw a certain number of children who are put in what are called advanced work classes. Then it has a core of children in regular inner city classes. And in addition, it has a developed special needs program. To be a school of the future, one has to do more than bring technology. One has to create a culture. Above all, we have to tackle the problems of demographics that are represented in the school. This is an attempt to make a sketch of what a school of the future might be like. 
Now, nobody really knows what the future will be like, but we know what it won't be like. We know it won't be lots of children sitting in desks with pencil and paper writing all the day. We know that these new technologies, these computers, will be an important part of it. If you go into any school or any home, you'll find many pencils, many crayons, many paintbrushes, because these are instruments that people have made part of their lives. They use the pencil whenever they have a need for it, to draw, to write a story, to calculate. And so the computer, it's the natural instrument for doing mathematics, for music, for a hundred other things. And our goal here is to make it sufficiently part of the culture of the place that everybody uses it when it's needed. There are many aspects to what goes on in the school. We see children here writing stories. In other parts of the school, we see music. We see very special projects like Lego Logo. This might sound like playing with toys, but that's just what's so clever about it. They are playing with toys in a very sophisticated way. The Lego Logo project is one in which children build with the construction set Lego and then interface their construction with the computers so that they can control them. The children are learning to program. They're learning important ideas about motion, about feedback. They're learning principles of engineering design. Above all, they're learning that knowledge is a unified thing and that the scientific and formal and mathematical knowledge is not something separate from their passion for toys, from the things they did since they were small children before they even came to school. For a long time, I've dreamed that music should have a very different role in the lives of children and how they learn. It's a strange fact about music that while we expect children to be creative in all other domains, we only expect them to reproduce other people's creative work in music. We expect children to make their own drawings, write their own stories, compose their own poems. We don't expect them to compose their own music. And this is a peculiar state of affairs which might be related to the nature of musical technology. With the computer as a musical instrument, it becomes possible to create a piece of music and hear it independently of your own performance skill. It does not mean sitting children in front of a computer all day or even all their music time. They work with a the computer, they work with real instruments, they even make their own instruments. Our goal here is not to take over the school with computers. Our goal is not to move in with a computerized curriculum. Our goal is better described as trying to build a computer culture. And this is what this project is about, to get experience in how to grow a new kind of learning environment in which a computer culture will be solidly and creatively embedded. Reconfigurable video is a computer-assisted method for organizing and accessing video materials. An original application titled Marital Fracture, A Moral Tale chronicles a couple's marital separation and the mediation process. Movie stills and sequences stored on video disc are combined with computer-generated text to create an electronic book, complete with moving illustrations. Viewers are encouraged to learn about the subject matter by choosing options which pique their interest rather than following a preordained path. Viewers have a choice of watching the documentary movie, browsing through multimedia articles, or using a variety of software tools to create their own presentations. Each movie segment on the video disc is represented by a pictorial index card, displaying a description of the scene's content and location. This video database provides access to the case study documentary in discrete amounts. One of the purposes of the project is to establish a model for the use of interactive video in education and social science research. A unique feature is video synchronized to transcript. You chose to leave. You did not want to work it out here with me. You did not want to try to make a new beginning. You wanted to strike out on your own. You wanted to go to another relationship.
you're being a little punitive to say that because I left, I've given up my my right to be here. All I'm that saying is you chose me. to leave rather than to work things out here. That's, you know, that's part of what I'm saying, yeah. But I also feel when you're saying that, that you're putting some sort of blame on me. That no, I said but that then, directly. But then what I'm you're saying is... Then I feel you. like what you're saying then is that there are consequences. Because I made that decision. There are consequences when a person decides to leave and go do something else. Yeah, I think there are consequences. The electronic book is a confluence of media combining film aesthetics, computerized information systems, and fundamentals of graphic design. Reconfigurable video is an editing process which gives viewers an opportunity to alter the configuration of a documentary movie. Picture icons represent segments from the database. A new movie is automatically constructed as icons are selected. I feel like I was put in the role for quite a number of times or a long period of time of being, well, I was the guilty person who, and I wanted to leave, and so therefore I had to give up these things. And I wanted to be reasonable, and I wasn't sure what the reasonable expectations or options were. Why you have a problem here? I mean, the mediation would have been fine if you said, look, this marriage just isn't working, not working for either of you. Um... There are obviously strong feelings between these two people, but also just immense anger and frustration. Expert commentary can be mixed with the case study, demonstrating the potential of new media technology to personalize the delivery of information. A divorce is a death. That's what it is. And Judge Fold was a former chief judge of the Court of Appeals. In the Jackie Gleason case, Gleason against Gleason, said, when a marriage is dead, the kindest thing to do is to quickly bury it. In some ways, I think being in divorce mediation is a little bit like uh, practicing medicine in geriatrics. You know, it, is, it requires a person who is dedicated to trying to make the best of a bad, of a bad thing. The Electronic Publishing Group addresses the intersection of personal computing with what are traditionally thought of as mass media, including broadcast television, radio, newspapers, books, and magazines. The project you're watching here, called Newspeak, is an interactive newspaper. It addresses the intersection of reading with that of programming. The newspaper is assembled by computational agents that glean their instructions from the gestures you make as you read the newspaper itself. On the front page, a touch-sensitive screen allows you to make gestures, peruse the articles in detail, and to touch words and find their correlation in other articles on the front page. If you'd like more information about any other article, a gesture on that article opens the newspaper to an internal page, the proverbial page 14, where the continuation of that article is shown as well as related information that may or may not have appeared on the front page of the edition. The articles you see are illustrated from local optical storage as well as from broadcast television. Thus, the newspaper illustrates some of the mergers possible when one adds computers to the receiving end of mass media technologies. In this case, touching the word cable retrieves articles from inside the newspaper and previous editions that feature the word or phrases including the word cable. In this article, the illustrations will be drawn from yesterday evening's broadcast television news. In Bellevue, Texas today, there was an explosion at an oil refinery. It set off a spectacular fire. Two workers are dead. And here's ABC's Charles Murphy. It was a spectacular fire. Flames from burning propane, butane, and gasoline towered 800 feet above a Chevron storage site near Houston. The Electronic Publishing Group has changed the newspaper from being a broadcast by evolving both the technology and the software, the interaction between the news systems, so that each edition of the newspaper is personalized and individual. No two people see the same edition. You also don't necessarily have precisely the same style or form of newspaper presented on successive days. 
Some of the notions of programming your own information access, drawn upon sources of standard mass media, are being demonstrated here. In this example, we have a thesis project that explores trying to build a common interface between broadcast and print databases. You can establish your own journals that are drawn from print and broadcast information and have those manipulated in a common interface. In this example, the Electronic Publishing Group is experimenting with a new style of magazine, where the magazine is now published continuously and the act of programming that magazine is akin to reading it. When you touch the articles directly, it draws upon your local library to show you different articles as well as to give you relevant ads and workshops to things that you might be interested in or already own. Under the direction of Professor Stephen Benton, the recently formed Spatial Imaging Group's aim is to develop and demonstrate the powerful potential of three-dimensional imaging as an efficient means for communications. One of their recent achievements is the invention of a new type of large-scale, multicolored computer graphic hologram. Now, ordinarily, the hologram just looks like a piece of glass or plain film, but when it's angled properly to the light, it uh, diffracts it and sends an image straight ahead to your eye. And uh, right here, that's a two-dimensional image. But if you move, or the hologram moves, then you see a, a sequence of right to left views that gives you the impression of three-dimensionality. And because the transition between those views is smooth enough, it actually looks like a hologram of a solid object. Research is now underway to make the holograms more quickly, in full color, and also much larger. The group is also working on such technical problems as developing specialized computer graphics assembling computer automated hologram printers, and inventing new optical systems for high quality production and display of large scale 3D images. Holographically stored images will be documented to allow convenient visualization of intricate shapes, forms, and spatial relationships in the fields of medicine, art, education, as well as architecture and in engineering design. In addition to their purely technical work, the group is deeply concerned with advances in the aesthetics of three-dimensional image creation and perception. A special emphasis will be placed on research in synthetic holograms, which are not made from real objects, but rather they are synthesized from hundreds of perspective views of an object rendered from a computed database, like those used for structural engineering. The images to be prepared for holographic hard copy can be quickly edited and previewed with interactive devices such as the Trillium Flight Simulator and then rendered in full realistic detail using computer ray tracing techniques. Ray tracing can also predistort the images to match the anamorphic projection optics designed into the new holographic exposure method. The design of those optical systems is also expedited with specialized interactive computer programs. The Holography Laboratory has been outfitted with state-of-the-art equipment, such as large vibration isolation tables, powerful argon and helium neon lasers, and programmable positioning equipment, which has been specially designed for holographic exposures. This is a uh, prototype of a new holographic format which we're calling the alcove hologram. In it, the holographic film is stretched around a concave cylinder to project the image out in front where you can almost touch it. And the cylindrical shape makes it visible over a wide viewing zone, almost 180 degrees. We expect to make some major changes in the overall look of holograms, not just in terms of the content, whether it's medical or engineering or computer graphic images, but in terms of the size, in terms of the color, and even in terms of the format of holograms. We expect holography to move ahead very quickly over the next several years. The conversational desktop explores styles of voice interaction and machine-mediated human communication. I'm here. Hi, Barry. Remember to. Get a gift for Steve before my flight to California. 
when I talk to Chris, remind me to. Ready to record. Tell him how my partner aids recognition. Okay, got it. Hi, Barry. Do you have a minute? Sure, what's up? Well, actually, I was wondering how the graphics display for your calendar was coming along. Oh, it's good. Um, I think my scheduler's having some trouble reaching some of the other workstations, though. Really? That's too bad. Maybe we should talk to Walker about the protocols. Yeah. Looks like I'm free this afternoon. Let's see if he has time. When can I meet with Walter this afternoon? With whom do you want to meet this afternoon? Walter. Walter is available today at 1. Confirm it. Meeting with Walter scheduled today at 1. Barry, why didn't it recognize your speech when we were talking? Because it only listens when I talk in its direction. Oh, I see. Does it bother you to wear that headphone all the time? Oh, uh, it's just like wearing a Walkman. Have you seen the... Uh... Okay, Barry, I'll see you this afternoon. All right, bye-bye. While you were busy, I took a message from Todd. Hey, Barry, you still want to have lunch? I'd love to get a bowl of chowder at Legal's. I'm going to Legal Seafood. Enjoy your lunch. Hello, Barry's telephone speaking. Who's calling, please? Hi, this is Mike McKenna. What's this in reference to? Your conversational messaging system. He's not available at the moment, but he left this message. I'm at lunch. I'll get back to you as soon as I return. At what number can he reach you? 225-7. Call Barry. Calling Barry's phone slave. Hi, Chris. He got your last message. I mailed you the paper this morning. If you'd like to leave another message, I'll record it now. Otherwise, just hang up and I'll tell him you called again. Hang up. I'm back. Hi, Barry. You have new messages. Hi, this is Mike McKenna. I'm interested in systems that emulate human conversation. I'd like to talk to you about your current work. Place a call to Chris. Remember to. Tell him how my parser aids recognition. Getting a call from Barry. Remember to. Ask him when he's coming back from San Francisco. Hi. Hi, I see you called during lunch. Yeah, I tried calling yesterday, too, but your machine said you were busy. I had a visitor, so it didn't interrupt. I'll give you a higher priority, so next time you'll get through. Oh, great, thanks. Listen, I wanted to talk to you about how my syntax analyzer reduces speech recognition errors. Sounds good. Let's sit down and talk about it after you get back. Great. Excuse me, I'll arrange it. Schedule... Just a moment, please. ...meeting, Monday afternoon. When do you want to meet with Chris Monday? Well... Meeting with Chris scheduled Monday at noon. When's my flight? Your plane to San Francisco leaves in one hour and 55 minutes. Traffic to the airport is heavy. Should I call you a cab? The Music Research Group, in collaboration with Paris's EARCOM, is researching computer understanding of live musical performance. Director Barry Virko. We're in the midst of some research here, a collaboration between the Experimental Music Studio of the Media Lab at MIT in Boston and Aircom in Paris, concerning the computer understanding of live musical performance. The objective here is to have the computer understand enough about what happens between live performers on stage that it can become a surrogate performer able to participate in ensemble situations. Now with a small piece of Sicilienne by Fritz Kreisler for violin and piano, the violin being live, the piano part being performed by a synthetic performer, the computer. How would you play this if you did not know that a computer was listening? For instance, uh, how, how would you really want to play that part? Let, let's just hear. Maybe I sh should take a little time here.
some of the things that you're doing there would be very confusing to the machine because it has no warning as to what you're going to do, such as this spot here when you had a pause before you play this next note. Uh, I think if we were to have it sight read, which it's doing right now, uh, it will be quite confused at those spots. Mm -hmm. But let's just see how well it can recover from uh, such interpretation. It's thoroughly confused by sight reading like that. But now that it's heard you playing, it has some sense of how you're going to play the piece. Mm -hmm. And as with a rehearsal between two live musicians, this synthetic performer should be able to now predict what you are going to do uh, as you're playing the piece. So at this point, it should know. Let's see if it has learned anything. <laughs> That's a distinct improvement, isn't it? Much better. Now let's try something much more difficult. This is the first sonata for violin and piano of Johannes Brahms. The difficulty here being that the relationship between the solo violin and the piano accompaniment is much more intricate. The piano accompaniment here being played by a synthetic performer, that of a computer with recorded piano sounds. understanding the relationship between performers. I suspect that in the future, composers will write four ensembles of live instruments and computer processed sound in chamber music uh, situations. And this is what we have to look forward to with the fruits of this kind of research. the children to think about, if you will, wet mentalities rather than silicon ones. In this way, we can teach an animated figure to reach and grasp objects in a simulated world. The technique tracks moving objects within a frame and uses this information to... computer interface as part of the essential information that a computer should have. To filter, define, qualify, and edit that information. A major part of this program addresses storing a complete high-quality movie on a consumer digital audio disc. Bureaucracy. Put that where? There. The Vivarium project is different things to different people. It's a, to the children who are undergoing it, it's a, a ten week curriculum in which they get more thoughtful about thinking by studying how animals think and 
a variety of different kinds of animals. And during these 10 weeks, a couple of times, they will simulate some of the animal behaviors uh, using computer graphics and things like this blimp, which is radio controlled and can act the part of a fish or a microorganism. Uh, it can move around. It has sensors for uh, knowing when it bumps into things. Uh, it can find its food source, which is electricity. And uh, it has everything except a brain, which is what the children will be supplying in part. One of our inspirations is this ecosystem sphere, which is a completely sealed environment that has live shrimp in it, uh, bacteria, some plant uh, material, and sunlight. And it's one of the simplest completely closed ecologies. Uh, in contrast, this little gadget is what we don't want to do, which is a robot that can respond by bumping into things and moving around, but it's mechanical. We want the children to think about, if you will, wet mentalities rather than silicon ones. Uh, to adults, uh, it's a much more challenging project than artificial intelligence because no one in artificial intelligence has yet been able to do uh, something as complicated as animal mentalities. So from our standpoint as computer scientists, we're very interested in developing new programming languages that can allow children to express these things. As educators, we're interested in finding out how to teach children something this complex in a simple way. One of the reasons why the Vivarium project is being done at MIT at Arts and Media Technology Lab is because this is a clash a collision between different kinds of cultures. There are people in artificial intelligence here, educators, people in graphics, arts, and other kinds of media. And it's a perfect kind of place to sort of rub the humanities up against technology. We'll have to do a whole new kind of computer graphics in order to express what animals actually look like. Um, we will have to do new kinds of user interaction because what we're, what we're talking about is the children being able to essentially program in terms of propensities rather than in terms of situation, action, behavior. So all of these things are quite new, but they really do flow from the idea that children are going to be the, the major parties in this experiment. We have a wonderful school that is prepared to go through five years of us trampling around through its corridors, and uh, we're all looking forward to that. It is now within our reach to automate much of the process of defining and controlling animated objects and generating high-quality images of such scenes. We can envision such a system running on a single workstation. Such a workstation represents a truly revolutionary new medium for the visualization of ideas, a tool equally powerful to the scientist wishing to simulate the world or the playwright roughing out a new work with the help of a computer animation generated from a script. The development of such an animation environment is currently underway. A prototype set of interactive graphic tools runs on our symbolic list machine, which includes rendering and data generation facilities. Objects can be created as combinations of predefined primitives or as solids of revolution. The system provides for an interactive transformation of simplified views of objects. The color editor allows interactive specification of the colors of objects in a variety of color spaces. Here, RGB and HSV are shown. Shading characteristics can also be controlled with an interactive editor. And texture maps can be easily painted and mapped onto objects. Part of a new generation of real-time display hardware, the Trillium Image Generator is an integral part of our animation pipeline 
allowing interactive and real-time animation previewing. To assemble graphical objects into hierarchically structured figures, we've implemented an interactive tool we call the Tree Editor. The kinematic structure of a jointed figure can be defined graphically and interactively. The Tree Editor is used to describe the transformation hierarchy which specifies how the limbs of a figure ought to move with respect to one another. Each node in the transformation tree represents a joint of the figure and each joint is described by four parameters. There are editing tools for drawing or copying segments and for handling complex figures. Integrating robotics technology into animation systems is essential to this new medium. Here, a jointed arm is following a moving object. The joint rotations are computed automatically. In this way, we can teach an animated figure to reach and grasp objects in a simulated world. Research in optical body tracking continues in a project called the Graphical Robot. This work began with a series of experiments in scripting by enactment, in which the gestures of an animator controlled animated figures directly. Hand and arm movements were extended to allow tracking of whole body motions. Our new work is based on an op-eye system with four cameras, which allow us to reconstruct 3D position data in real time from the images of the LEDs detected by the cameras. The next generation of body tracking experiments will make use of real-time animation and inverse kinematic algorithms so that the animator can pose figures much like life-sized virtual mannequins, ultimately to shape whole movements and perhaps one day teach motor skills by example. We look forward to integrating these tools into a powerful animation workstation as computer graphics move into the fifth generation. The Advanced Television Research Program, headed by Professor William Schreiber, is funded by 10 U.S. television broadcasters and equipment suppliers. As a television research center, ATRP is uniquely designed to serve as a national laboratory for the study of television technology. Some of ATRP's activities include research relating to improvements in existing TV systems, as well as the creation of new systems. The goal of the research is to determine how improvements can be made in received picture quality without undue use of scarce broadcast spectrum. Possible improvements include increased definition, reductions in noise and flicker, and better motion rendition. Researcher Mike Isnardi Two promising ways of enhancing standard television are through line interpolation and frame interpolation. By averaging two adjacent lines, we can create new lines, thereby doubling the number of lines displayed. Here are four examples of the same image reconstructed with a different number of scanning lines. The picture in the upper left represents the picture quality of today's system. Notice that the scanning lines are quite visible. If we apply the line interpolation as just described, the result is the picture on the upper right which has twice the number of displayed lines and a much improved picture quality. We can also apply the same technique to images that start out with a higher number of lines per frame. For instance, the image on the bottom left represents the picture quality of the proposed Japanese high-definition television system. By applying line interpolation, we can enhance the definition even further, resulting in the image here. Also, by comparing the enhanced television image to the high-definition television image, we can see that the image quality is quite similar. However, the high-definition television image would require at least four times the bandwidth than that used in the present system. Here's another example of enhancing picture quality. A technique known as motion interpolation can be used to insert new frames in between the original ones. 
The technique tracks moving objects within a frame and uses this information to create intermediate frames. For example, the image sequence on the left consists of only two single frames. The image sequence on the right contains three additional frames. The extra frames have been generated by motion interpolation. Notice how smooth appears the motion of the ball. This same technique can be applied to smooth out the motion in any image sequence, as this early test demonstrates. On your left is the original sequence. On the right is a sequence with two additional frames generated by motion interpolation. The original image sequence. The sequence with motion interpolation. The Audience Research Facility is a newly formed MIT laboratory dedicated to the study of audience responses to new developments in audio and video technologies. The facility is located off campus in the Liberty Tree Mall in Danvers, Massachusetts. This makes possible the recruitment of a relatively representative sample of adult subjects drawn from a diverse cross-section of industrial, suburban, and semi-rural communities. The mall has approximately 118 stores and draws an estimated daily traffic of 25,000 shoppers per day. Subjects are recruited out of the mall and are then escorted to the research facility where they participate in a variety of research studies. The facility itself is 1,200 square feet and is divided into four research areas. One research room is designed to simulate an average living room. It includes a two-way mirror so that the subjects can be left to explore new media in a situation that is closer to a home than a typical laboratory. Here, subjects are comparing various degraded video clips of Miami Vice. These evaluations will provide valuable background for future developments in video resolution technologies. A specially designed audio room adjoins the control room. False walls and two-way mirrors conceal the equipment and allow for blind comparisons. Here, the subject is comparing a digital to analog sound source. The audience research facility is also equipped to study a number of interactive technologies. Here, the video game Battlezone is being used in a study examining the relationship between video games and spatial cognition. Currently, work is also being conducted on audience responses to a variety of interactive video-based systems. This research at the facility will serve as a valuable tool to help understand how audiences will respond to new changes in media such as the addition of user control and improvements in display technology. What groups will use the new media, how they will be used, and what effects they will have are all questions that will finally be addressed at the new audience research facility. The Human Machine Interface Group is headed by Richard Bolt. Eye movements have been used for a number of purposes. They've been used to study where people look on a page when they're reading. They've been used to study where pilots look at the instrument arrays in airline cockpits. And they've been used to, to study where children look uh, at their favorite characters on Sesame Street. We tell, for example, whose turn it is to take in a conversation by where the eyes are trained in conjunction with what we're saying and the total context of the situation. Now, one of the areas where eye movements have not been used has been at the human-computer interface as part of the essential information that a computer should have about its human user. What I've been doing is trying to study how eye movements as output, output from the person to the machine, and indeed from the machine back to the person, can be brought into the human-computer interface. Consider the situation of, well, a wall of a room portrayed here in graphics. And this little flying dot is their momentary point of regard on the scene. Now, if we were to record that, it would look like so. Here, we're preserving the momentary point of regard and recording the distribution of visual attention about the scene. And very quickly here, we can see that the interest is very high 
in the candelabra and the andirons, but not very much so in the ship model, nor in the paintings particularly. So if a program here were trying to explain or describe these items in this room to a, an observer, it would concentrate mostly upon the brass items here and not so much upon the others. Let's consider a situation now where we have two programs, one called Looker and the other called Shoah, interacting in the following way. Looker will be looking about and its eye contact is shown by this flashing square and the flashing on of these items corresponds in a very speeded up fashion to the fact that Shoah would now be giving some kind of explanation. Another example of a graphic that might be explained by the Showa program would be the exterior wall of a building with architectural details on the edges, a certain type of brickwork, windows and door details. And the explanation of the details of this wall would be modulated by where upon this wall the looking of the looker program was concentrated. Obviously, if it were concentrated on the doors, the explanation by the Showa program in uh, synthesized speech would concentrate upon telling about the details of that door. Eventually, Showa will be personified in a small graphic like so and would establish eye contact back out to the uh, human observer. So there would be a conversation going back and forth between the looker program on the one hand and the shower program. The shower program paying attention to where the simulated point of regard was upon this scene. At some point in all of this exploration, we'll be taking out the looker program and substituting a real human observer who will be eye tracked and the looking by the human upon this screen will drive the response of the Showa program. The ultimate aim here is to improve the quality of conversationality at the interface between the computer and its human user. The computer is phenomenally powerful in synthetic medium. Each day massive quantities of information are pumped through these electronic systems. The graphics group was founded to investigate this electronic revolution's impact on the practice of graphic arts and visual communications. There are two very important things that the Visible Language Workshop is, is looking at. One is the way in which graphics, which we define in the broadest sense, can be used to filter, define, qualify, and edit that information. And secondly, what the interface or the relation that the surface or the access of the person to the machine can be like to promote the most creative and the most generative means of communication. Because of the computer's capacity to store and retrieve huge quantities of information, it is the designer's role to make this information decipherable and accessible to individual users. The Intelligent Page program takes raw, graphically unfiltered information and redesigns it for increased readability. This is the same text after reformatting. Using limited intelligence, the machine conforms the text to meet the preferences of the individual user. This is where the text goes. This zigzag line here shows that the text is flush left, ragged right, and it's also used to indicate the letting or the line spacing of the text. This little arrow here is, uh, indicates how far the paragraphs are indented. Okay, so once Using limited intelligence, the machine conforms the text to meet the preferences of the individual user. Uh, it can also be sent to a hard copy output device. So this might form the basis of a personalized electronic clipping service that you'd receive in your home on a daily basis. Uh, it can be sent to uh, sound output. We're working on a system which employs a rule base to assist in the process of graphic design and text layout. 
to do this, we're using an expert system development tool called CAS, and we've chosen the design of business cards to serve as a case study. In what industry is your profession? Financial, advertising, art, or science? Advertising. What position do you hold? Management. What is your company's financial scale? Medium. What type of image would you like to project? Progressive. Please wait while I get creative. Given the internal rules that we've put into the system, it's decided that this particular layout is appropriate for me based on the answers I gave it. For example, the background of the card is gray rather than white, and the text is left justified over on the right side of the card. Had the user responded that he was an eccentric artist, the card might look something like this. Future research of the graphics group will include exploring new verbal and visual languages in an expanding computer environment, an environment in which instructions may become conversations and tools become intelligent assistants. The director of the Movies of the Future program, Andrew Lipman. The Future of the Movies program is a new research effort directed at revolutionizing the production, distribution, home delivery, and viewing of motion pictures. A major part of this program addresses storing a complete high-quality movie on a consumer digital audio disc, as well as exploring several electronic methods for direct-to-the-home delivery. What you're seeing here is a small movie being played right from the computer. We're demonstrating various image quality levels, image coding techniques, and image sizes. To squeeze an entire image into the smallest space possible, we are exploring ways to use very few bits per point to represent a full color image. These sequences compare a priori allocation of colors in the image to adaptive schemes, where the colors used are chosen from the image sequence itself. In addition, spatial dither is used to make the errors less visible. In this sequence, we're comparing scan conversion methods, whereby we can assemble a high-quality image frame from a series of low-quality ones. On the left, computer text with high vertical detail is compared with a normal television image. If you grab frames from several different periods of time, there's often flicker, but the image quality of the computer-generated data looks better. This final sequence shows inter-frame vector quantization. On the left is the original image sequence, and on the right, the coded version. The left-hand image uses three times the bandwidth of the one on the right. Equal bandwidth versions are shown here. Network Plus is an experiment in merging newspaper data with television broadcasts. Closed caption data transmitted with the evening news is used to retrieve news articles that annotate the live broadcast. The computed program may be watched, read, or printed afterward. And Justice William Rehnquist has been nominated to replace him. That leaves a vacancy on the court, and the man who is nominated to be the newest justice is Antonin Scalia who presently sits on the U.S. Court of Appeals. So it's a major event in the life and times of this country, and we begin our coverage with Sam Donaldson at the White House. It was a secret that hadn't leaked. President Reagan's announcement today... As the program is assembled by the computer, selected frames that are detected to be of interest by the program are grabbed and saved in the upper corner. Those frames can be used in the printed edition to illustrate the newspaper. ...about to sort out the principles that underlay the framer's words. The talking block system provides children with a word processor which speaks its input at the completion of each word. The machine doesn't have a precise vocabulary of words it can utter, but instead will attempt to say anything which is typed into it. The basic building blocks are not alphabetic characters but phonemes, the true building blocks of the English language. Pressure keyboard. The pressure-sensitive keyboard is a carefully altered standard keyboard which is able to detect how hard the keys are being depressed by the typist. Some possible applications include a text editor which uses the pressure information as an indication of expressiveness, or a security system which uses type style to identify an individual. Power. 
at the inter Color text editing has been developed to allow for the inclusion of color cues into a word process document. The color is used as a carrier of intent rather than as a design element. The goal is to preserve the history and evolution of a document as part of the document itself. Newsprint. The newsprint system takes the notation of personalized television broadcast into the realm of hard copy. The system formats a newspaper with both text and color visuals based on television news. Laminar display. The laminar display creates spatially distinct images without requiring the viewer to use special glasses. The images are overlapped by using surface reflections off a window pane held at 45 degrees to the line of sight. The display has been used in conjunction with a word processor where comments and deletions appear on different planes from the original text. Phonetic Dictionary The Phonetic Dictionary is a dictionary whose words can be found via their pronunciations instead of their spelling. This dictionary is most useful to those who have yet to master the complex spelling rules of English, such as children and non-native speakers and could also serve as a new type of spelling corrector. A hundred years ago, I don't think anybody would have said that machine intelligence was inevitable or even possible, but something happened. Uh, around the turn of the century, it was discovered that machines could do more than anyone had dreamed. It was implicit in the work of some mathematicians. And then uh, the great logician Gödel discovered that it was possible for a machine to represent itself, represent its own workings. And that was the first glimmering of the idea that a machine could simulate another machine or simulate itself. The idea that a machine was an infinite source of variations is a new idea and uh, so I think it is a new step in evolution there's never been anything like it or an idea like that you see until that point people thought that each machine did a certain thing and that if you wanted something done you would have to build a machine to do that and that's all it could do but this discovery in the 1930s changed our view it was discovered that if you made the right kind of machine and that's what a computer is it in a sense could do anything 